Well, greetings and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Unit 1, the Pre-Columbian Era, Section 6, The Slave Issue. So, in our previous uh, section, we talked about the Europeans coming to North and South America. We talked about the Columbian Exchange. We talked about all the goods that are going across the Atlantic in a uh, back-and-forth motion goods going from the Americas to Europe and goods from Europe coming to the Americas. And one of the huge drawbacks of this Colombian exchange was the slave trade itself. Uh, this was um, actually kicked off by Christopher Columbus himself. Remember in unit or section five, I even mentioned, you know, Columbus has a very negative side and is that he really started this issue of slavery. Now, he wasn't using African slaves at the time. Instead, uh, he really began with um, enslaving Na uh, Native American peoples. And the Spanish were very brutal to the Native Americans. Uh, those that didn't die of disease were often rounded up and forced to work in mines in Central and South America, digging for silver, digging for gold, uh, looking for precious jewels, uh, things like that. And so within just a few years, the Spanish and Portuguese began to uh, realize that using Indian slaves was not going to be a feasible process. And so in 1503, they began to bring enslaved Africans to South America, uh, where they would be used to mine that gold and silver in those mines. The illustration here to the right is an engraving uh, of the Spanish uh, enslaving the American Indian populations. They are digging, uh, and this is a kind of a representation of a mine situation and they are uh, dumping the dirt, if you will, in front of the Spanish so they can be checked for gold and silver and precious jewels. Uh, the slave trade itself actually starts in Africa. And what usually happens here is that um, slaves were going to be captured during warfare between competing tribes. Uh, so if tribe A uh, is victorious, a lot of times the folks of tribe B if they're not brought into Tribe A as um, personal property or whatever, they're going to be taken as slaves and they're going to be sold uh, to other tribes closer and closer to the coastline. On the coast, white traders who are there often pick up these slaves. Uh, these slaves are then taken wherever they're needed. And it is estimated that over the course of several hundred years, so let's, let's call it from 1503 to roughly 1720, we're going to estimate that about 10 million Africans were brought from Africa to the Americas as slaves. Now, you notice I'm saying the Americas. This is not just the United States. I'm talking about North America, Central America, and South America combined. About 90% of all of those slaves, so about 9 million, actually went to South and Central America or the Caribbean. That leaves about 10% or uh, actually less once you get down to it because about 500,000-ish, uh, about 5% are going to be brought into British North America. And we'll talk about what British North America is later. Uh, but uh, the slave trade originates in Africa comes across the Atlantic, and ultimately about 10 million Africans are going to be brought to the North and South American uh, continents. Now, big question is, why are they concentrating on African slaves? Well, we already talked about earlier that originally Spanish conquistadors, the Spanish powers, used Native American Indians as their slaves, as their work force. They've quickly found out that American Indians are very susceptible to European disease. We discussed this in Section 5 just uh, the other day. The other thing that we find is that the Native Americans have support if they run away. 
Now, if you stop and think about it, it makes sense. If you are a Native American taken as a slave, you manage to get away, you may be a slave in the area where you grew up, and you're able to escape. You may have friends, relatives, family, tribe, whatever, uh, nearby who can help you escape. And so they found it very difficult to keep these American Indians as slaves. What they also found is that African Americans or Africans were viewed as superior workers. And so they're going to be more highly desired. There's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, many of the Africans who came to the Americas had already been a farmer back home in Africa. They farmed a lot of the same crops. And so they are able to adapt very easily. And in many cases, they knew more than the Spanish about the crops that they were farming. And so we find that the uh, Africans were much better at that work. Now, is that true 100% of the time? Absolutely not. Uh, there were people who had no idea what they were doing, placed as slaves uh, to do a specific task. And so it, there's always exceptions to the rule. The other thing that... Uh, European powers found were that many Africans already had some immunity to European diseases. If you remember in Section 5, we talked about those diseases coming in and wiping out 90% of the American Indian population. Many Africans had been exposed for generations to many of these diseases, and therefore they had that herd immunity uh, to an extent. Now, is that true again at 100% of the time? No. But some, many had this immunity to European diseases. So they were less likely to die on their conquerors. Finally, they have nowhere to go if they run away. An African slave plucked from the continent of Africa, brought 4,000 miles across the Atlantic, and dropped off into what is now the United States or into a Caribbean island. If they run away, they have no support system to escape permanently. They have nowhere to go and no support. So it kind of isolates them into this. And that's why the European powers began to look at Africa very hard and say, we need to bring these people here as our workforce. Now, uh, image here just um, showing a captured um, group of slaves being marched to the coast uh, they are um, very, it's a pitiful sight. It is, it's a shame that it comes to this. Now, obviously, they are being driven by these individuals. Uh, they are chained. They are yoked together, uh, being forced to walk. And um, it's, it's just part of that African trade that developed in Africa. Now, there is something called the triangular trade that goes along with this, and this is kind of a key element here. So by the late 1600s, so about 150, 200 years after Columbus, we have a definite trade route established. Uh, it's called the triangular trade. And if you take a look at the map, you can see there are products coming from Europe to Africa. There are products from Africa to North the Americas. And when I say products, we're talking slaves, unfortunately. There are products coming from North America back to Europe. And so what we see is we have these raw materials harvested in the Americas are taken to the Europe. They are turned into manufactured goods. And they are then taken either back to Americas or they come to, to Africa, where they are traded for slaves. This is what is called the Middle Passage. The middle passage. So think of it as the middle part of a triangle. This middle passage is where we have ships that take slaves from the African coast to the Americas. I cannot underestimate or undervalue to you how brutally horrific the middle passage would have been for these people. They are going to be crammed together on ships, hundreds and hundreds, shoved together in very tight, tight quarters, uh, no sanitation, basic water and basic meal, like bread, if that, 
given to them just to sustain them long enough to get across the Atlantic. This is a journey that's going to take at least 90 days or so, so about three months. They're going to be on this ship crammed together with hundreds of other people, chained together, no sanitation. The dead are going to be passed up every morning to the Europeans paying the ship, and they're going to be thrown over the side. That was an acceptable loss on the trip. About 10 to 15 percent was considered acceptable losses. Think of how horrific that is, that it was okay to lose 10 or 15 percent of these people uh, on this trip. Once they got to the Americas, they were then be fed, um, cleaned up, and then sold uh, to uh, farmers and other peoples in the Americas who wanted these slaves. So ultimately, it's all about the economics here. Um, we're going to look at how it is going to be cheaper for many people to buy a slave for life than to hire a white servant for several years. Uh, that's going to be pretty uh, brutal economics, but we're going to look at that in our next unit on colonial uh, colonialism. And we also have this term African disapora. Uh, disapora goes back to a biblical term to uh, talk about the Jews being driven out of the Holy Land. In this case, the African disapora refers to this forced spread of the African people out of Africa. Uh, and it's all because of slavery. And so we can't undervalue how horrifically bad this is going to be for these African people. Uh, they are going to be um, snatched away from their homes, uh, not just their homes, but their family, uh, their home continent even. And they're going to be brought thousands of miles into an unknown situation where they're going to be treated with barbaric inhumanity. And uh, that's kind of where we're going to end on this. Uh, we're going to touch on slavery again as we go through several units leading up to the American Civil War. And so just think about the uh, barbaric inhumanity uh, as slavery evolves around money. It's about the economics. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is going to end us for Unit 1, the pre-Columbian era, and Section 6.